So, we were having this discussion, this interesting discussion, and I was relating how in the Bhagavatam, and there's these examples of these amazing women like Gandhari, who didn't want to be better than her husband, so because her husband was blind, she voluntarily blindfolded herself, just so she wouldn't have an advantage over him or be in a superior position, which, which is, it's not something that is common for women today. I don't think it's really common for women ever. It's a very exalted position. And so then we were saying, and I was saying, but I know you women today, you would feel, you feel like if you're perhaps too submissive or too much like these ideal women, then you would be taken advantage of. And they said, yes. Um, Pawak, tomorrow I arrive in Israel at 10 o'clock, Tel Aviv. Then I go to Harish for a week and then to Ariel for the next week. You can talk to Balakrishna. He should know the schedule exactly. So, and the women said, the women said, yeah, that, you know, there's this fear that if we act like these ideal wives, we'll be taken advantage of. And devotees often say that. If I become humble, I'll be taken advantage of. Things like that. So I'm not going to be humble, Prabhus, because if I become humble, I'll be taken advantage of. So I'm not going to be this, you know, I'll be a good wife and everything, but a really ideal one, I don't think it's a good idea, I'll be taken advantage of. And so then, we were discussing how when, in any relationship of superior and inferior, for lack of a better word, although husband and wife is not really superior or inferior, but in any kind of relationship where a person should take that role of, a more sub, of the more submissive role as a guru, disciple, or husband and wife, or student, teacher, or citizen and king, the problem you have which creates this situation where the wife or the disciple or whatever can't give themselves fully is if they have doubt that the husband or the guru or the king or whatever the authority is the teacher is ideal as a teacher or guru husband if if they are it's so much easier to submit or to act as one is supposed to so you know men want submissive wives but they don't, they don't always realize that they have to be the kind of husband that a wife could be submissive to. So you men, you can make it easier on your wife to be submissive by being a good husband because naturally if you're a good husband, they want to serve you. They want to please you. They want to go along with your will because you're also doing the same for them. So when we talk about ideal women, I don't think the men should think that it exists within a vacuum, but they have much to do about creating the ideal wife that they want by being the ideal man that the ideal wife could be ideal to, if you know what I mean. So that was the discussion, and I think that's an important point. And then we, had, we continued the discussion, and I made another point, which was also equally important, is that Prabhupada was, was really, in the ultimate issue, not attached to his female disciples being these ideal chaste wives, although in his books he does mention that being an ideal chaste wife is the goal, is the goal for women. So, So what, what was Prabhupada attached to? He was attached to the relationship working out and a relationship being Krishna conscious. That's what he cared about. And so generally, you know, the ideal is the way it works out, but sometimes the ideal is not the way it works out. It may work, work out in different ways. So that we shouldn't be overly attached to role models. Well, I'm the husband, I'm the wife, this is how I should be, or this is how you should be. That's true, generally, but sometimes that doesn't work, or it's not, it's not the way a wife can be or wants to be, and the husband may not 
it may be wise not to demand behavior that doesn't work for her because if it doesn't work for her and he forces her, she won't be happy and then he won't be happy. So, so Prabhupada was practical and I told a couple stories which are interesting stories that one woman, married woman, was initiated as a Brahmin before her husband. So later her husband got Brahminical initiation and Prabhupada asked her to give him the Gayatri Mantra. Usually the Gayatri Mantra is given by the Guru or Guru's representative, like maybe Temple President wouldn't really give it. Usually Prabhupada would put it on tape. But maybe before he put it on tape, he would ask people to give it as representative of him. So she gave it to her husband. So she kind of like became an initiating guru of sorts, a Ritvik initiation, something like that. So um, another time, devotee said, my wife is more advanced than me, but the husband should tell the wife, you know, be in charge. And Prabhupada said, then you just listen to her. So, so as I'm saying, Prabhupada wasn't attached to roles. Now, having said that, we're going to read about the role of women. And ladies, when you hear these things, you probably, some of you might say, well, I could do some of that, but all of that, that sounds like something only great women did, or it sounds impractical. What you should, what you should think is, understand the basic principles, as we said last week. And um, it's something It's something there in Shastra. It's just there for you to process as best you can. Um, and we'll discuss it a little more. So I want to finish this because we've been talking about women. For, this is the fourth class, so I wanted to finish it so that we can get on the case of the guys because, you know, they need it. Right, ladies? Okay, so we're going to be reading some more from Shastra. This is this is Draupadi. This is Draupadi speaking in the Mahabharata, and she's talking about how she, as a wife, takes care of the takes care of the um, family. Personally, I wait every day with food, drink, and clothes upon the revered and truthful Kunti, that mother of heroes. I never show any preference for myself over her in matters of food and attire, and I never verbally reprove that princess who is equal to the earth herself in forgiveness. In other words, this whole section of this book are quotations regarding how nicely the wife serves the relatives, the mother, the father, and brothers of her husband. Be the ruler of your husband's father, be the ruler of your husband's mother, be the ruler of your husband's sisters, be the ruler of your husband's brothers. It doesn't mean control them. It means take care of them. And then, of course, you'll say, but my mother-in-law abuses me. Yeah, so then we go back to this point. Kunti doesn't abuse Draupadi. So then you have this this like such a problem, you know, because you're supposed you're supposed to act in a certain way, and then you say, "Yeah, but when I act that way, I'm abused." That's unfortunate. It's just really unfortunate. So then, how do we understand this? You say, "Here's an example." We have to understand that's the ideal. That's what we should be doing, but. Um, You have, to, as I said, you know, Prabhupada would look at everything as to how it helps Krishna consciousness. So sometimes acting in the ideal way may not help because you're being abused or mistreated because of it. So you have to adjust. Now, in this next section of the book, we're talking about the wife being of a similar quality to the husband. The wife is expected to be of the same category as the husband. She must be prepared, pre -prepared to follow, be prepared to follow the principles of her husband. And then there will be happy life. If the husband is a devotee and the wife is materialistic, 
There cannot be any peace at home. The wife must see the tendencies of the husband and must be prepared to follow him. So if you go to, uh, if you Google Grihasta Vision Team, G R H A S T H A or G R I H A S T A, Grihasta Vision Team, go to their website and then Google, uh, not Google, do a search for premarital and then there will be a document that comes up with about, I don't know, 50, 100, 200 questions that you ask your spouse before you get married, which help both of you realize if you are on the same wavelength, if you are of the same nature. That's basically what Prabhupada's saying here on all these matrimonial sites, they do that, so... It seems to be an eternal principle. Be of the same category. Did we read this last time? Does anyone remember? Remember hearing this? Of course, it's, it's always good to review. Anyway, I'll continue reading. Yeah, we did read that. And then there's a, solilo a soliloquy of Draupadi explaining how she serves her husband. We read this long ago in another class, so I'm not going to read that, but basically the principle was that she served, served them very faithfully, very obediently, very submissively, and she always had a good temperament and, and just tried to please them. And the conclusion was it said, it said that in that way she controlled her husband. So this is how Prabhupada says that, you know, Everybody likes to be in control, and women want to be in control also of their husband to some degree in the family. And Prabhupada says, by satisfying the husband the way Draupadi satisfied the Pandavas, he said, that's actually how you control the husband, because you're serving so nicely, and you have such a nice disposition, he becomes so much indebted to you, and he'll just want to do whatever you ask. And we have that example of Chaivana Muni, that he was grouchy, and he was an old man, and so Kanya served him so nicely that for her, as a service to her, out of his mystic power, he gave himself, he turned himself into a beautiful, young, muscle-bound Bollywood star. And he was really beautiful. You know, she had married this old, irritable guy, and all of a sudden he's turned into this beautiful, young, muscle-bound movie star just to satisfy her because he was so satisfied with her service. So, <laughs> any document for after marriage? Most of them are for after marriage, but there's one particularly for um, those who haven't been married or not married like everyone else but you listening <laughs> right now on here, I think, is not married. So, right? Let's see who's here. Yeah, no one's married yet. So, there's another thing that we had talked about today in relation to this is that it's important to understand that we all have natures. I don't know if I mentioned this before, but we all have natures. And so some things about us we can change and some things about us are just our nature. And a lot of times spouses would like to change the nature of the other spouse, but some things will not change. And so it's important to understand that. Of course, what Prabhupada's saying here, before you get married, you should you should find out similarities. And if you're too if you're too dissimilar, it can be a problem. I have personal experience of that also, that the more similarities there are in, in nature, culture and so forth, the less the more you naturally get along. Okay. Now here's an interesting point. We're kind of skipping around, but uh, dabbling right now a little bit, but I think they're all salient points. They're important. This is about the... Um, anyway, let's read it and see what it says. As stated in the Bhagavad Gita 9.32, Striyo Vaishas Tata Shudas Tepi Yanti Param Gatim. Women are not considered very powerful in following the spiritual principles. But if a woman is fortunate enough to get a suitable husband who is spiritually advanced, and if she always engages in his service, she also gets the same benefit as her husband. Here it is clearly said 
that the wives of Subari Muni also entered the spiritual world by the influence of their husband. They were unfit, but because they were faithful followers of their husband, they also entered the spiritual world with him. Thus a woman should be a faithful servant of her husband, and if the husband is spiritually advanced, the woman will automatically get the opportunity to enter the spiritual world. Today we had discussed this, and one of the devotees there said it's also true for the man. He gets, if he has a chaste wife, he'll get the benefit. He'll get the benefit of her spiritual advancement. But the point being made here is that Shastra says it's one of the highest duties of a woman is to be faithful to the husband. And so what it means is that by giving herself to the husband through that service, she gets the benefit of his spiritual advancement. So she, she is not being exploited, but look what she's getting. She's getting his advancement. So similarly, when a disciple serves the guru, he gets, the disciple gets the blessings of the guru and the disciple advances that way. So it's a similar, similar principle is being told here. Of course, devotees in ISKCON, women who are initiated, don't think that they're going to go back to God that's solely by serving their husband. They understand that they serve their guru, they, he's, they have regular principles to follow, they have their rounds to chant, so many things. But at least the principle you understand is that you will get the blessings of Krishna by serving your husband and you will share in his advancement. It's not, of course, the only way. Wow, I skipped so fast in this chapter, we came to the end and I thought it was going to take us a whole hour to come to the end. So we can read some more in this chapter because the next chapter is about men and I'd rather start it as a separate course. Or of course, if you have any questions you'd like to ask, that's also, we can entertain them, especially in regards to um, duties of a woman. But if, we, if, if I were to sum up the duties of a woman, I would say, I would say the main things are that her consciousness should be focused on making the man happy. Following the vows that he follows. Making his life comfortable. Always being in a good mood. And it's, so it's, it's very much in the mood of pleasing the husband. That's that's what we learn from Shastra, which if the husband's a devotee, that's wonderful, right? Because we like to please other devotees. And then we had this discussion today and say, well, all right, we'll say, Alejandro says, well, could you explain more about the nature of the person? How can we know what is our nature? Well, you, if you all want to do something fun, and many devotees feel this this system of understanding your nature is very is valid and useful. You Google Enneagram, and I'm not sure how to spell it, E N, maybe two N's, E N N A G R A M. Enneagram. And the Enneagram shows, I believe, nine personality types. And most people have one of those personalities prominent and maybe another one which is less prominent. But before you do that, let me just explain it to you so you understand it. And I don't want to create an Enneagram cult, but I think it's useful, particularly in marriage, at least to understand a principle. Yeah. If the men serve the women, they get... If a woman is chaste, then yes, they get benefit also. So the Enneagram delineates nine kinds of persons. And then it's nine kinds of personality types. And you'll... If you look at the Enneagram, why don't you look at it later? And I'll explain it, the principle, a little bit. If you look at it, you'll see that there, there are certain qualities that really predominantly describe you, one of the nine. And you'll know and you'll recognize other people and you go, oh, so-and-so is such a number nine. He's 
she's such a typical number nine, I can't believe it. This is amazing, this enneagram. How did and so and so is such a number three. I think number three or two or three is the helper. I always want to help people, just always they just give their whole life to help. Mother Teresa was a number was the helper. It's called the helper. And then, I don't remember all of them, but anyway, the point is that when you look at the Enneagram, you see very distinct personality types. And the Enneagram also will, I think it explains on some of the websites, that certain personality types just should not be together because they're they don't those personality types don't work well together. And, and, but when you look at that, you'll see that it's, it's all common sense. It'll, make, it'll just make sense to you. You might say, yeah, I don't like people like that, and I can see I am like of this type. So that's one way you can do it. Another way you can do it, Alejandro, is if you, if you go to the Grass Division team and you download and you, and you search on the site itself premarital, then there I think actually I already sent you that document, so you already have it. So I sent Alejandro that document, and it's a document of questions. I sent Timothy the document also. It's a document of questions which people who are thinking about get, getting married would ask of one another. And that, that will also help you see the similarities. Because it's, kind of, it's kind of what it's doing is it's, it's just asking questions about what, what, you, you know, what do you like, what do you do, what are your goals. And maybe there's questions on there. There's more questions you could ask that aren't on there more directly about your spiritual life. But I would say, for example, if you come from a well-educated family and you're well-educated and your spouse comes from a very simple family, not very well-educated, that could be a problem. Different, you know, different class of people. You come from a very wealthy background, your spouse comes from a very poor background. That could be a problem. It's just culturally you may just not even be able to talk about things. That you won't even be able to relate. So a lot of that a lot of that matching up is can you relate to this person? I mean, you just sit down and talk and it's like it's almost like you're talking to your brother or sister. You're just you're on the same wavelength. It's just you don't even have to say things, and you just both understand. You go, yeah. You heard? Did you hear that class? How did you feel that class? And you both feel exactly the same way, good, bad, or whatever. It's like you're you're just you're like, yeah, they said that. That was really good. Or that was really bad. And you're both you just you think like that. You're, you're so similar. It's not that you know. You're ultra ultra liberal. Your husband's ultra conservative. It's your it's your nature. You're always super open minded. Everything and you're accepting of everyone. And your husband's very closed minded. Not accept. So you, it, it's really a lot of it's just common sense. You know, you're very into being a traditional Indian, submissive servant wife. And your husband is like totally into you know Western society, and you know everything's equal, and he doesn't like it that you're so submissive. And you see what I'm saying? It's it's quite common sense when you actually look at it. But the Grihasta Vision team documented asked, I think, premarital counseling questions to to. to get people to start thinking what what is it that they're into in their life and lifestyle or then they can compare notes because sometimes you'll find that your aspir aspirations in life are completely different so i think the more you think about and like you're saying well how do you know your nature well look at someone else's nature and and ask the question is, am I like that? You'll start to see how you're different. Um, Alejandro, your nature is you like to help people. Yes? And I think 
your nature is that you could make a lot of personal personal sacrifices of your own in order to help other people. Yes? Am I right? I think I'm right. Am I right, everybody? Is that Alejandra's nature? Yes. Okay. So, on the anagram, you could be the helper. That could be, I don't know, if that problem, you have to see the other ones, right? You could be the helper. Now, if, let's say, you're married to a person who's very much into, well, I just want to, you know, I've done a lot of work for the world, and I've, I've, you know, been a brahmachari for a long time, and now I just want to settle down, and I want to have a, my, a nice house and a nice family. So he's really into thinking about, he's really into thinking about the house. You know, I'd like to have a nice house, you know, like, and, you know, because he's like, I've made so much sacrifice, I just want to take care of myself. You know, you know so I want to have a nice place, you know, a nice car, a nice job, and I just want to really be comfortable and go to the temple on Sunday. And you're like, let's go out and save the world. You don't want to marry that guy unless he's fine with you saving the world and he's going to foot the bill and, you know, he's happy that you're around the world starting orphanages and this and that. Yeah, then, you know, but generally that's not going to work. So you understand how, I mean, you could work those things out, but you could work those things out, but you, you could understand, wouldn't it be better for you, because you're a very selfless person, it would be really difficult if you marry someone who's selfish. And people by personal, some people by personality type are very selfish. They just, they can't sacrifice much of the, you know, can you do this? No, I can't. Why not? Because every day at seven o'clock, this is what I do. I've done it for the last 10 years. I, don't, I can't budge. Yeah, but the house is on fire. I'm, I'm sorry. I'd like to help Prabhu, but you know. Somebody could get injured. I'd really like to help, but this is just what I do. There are people like that. I'm not, this sounds funny, but there are people like that who wouldn't save someone in a burning house because it would throw them off their personal schedule, which is very important for them to maintain that schedule to keep their sanity and peace and balance. So that's, so that's what they're concerned about. Now, if two people like that are together, then they'll have this really nice house and every square inch of the house will be comfort personified because that's how they think, right? And they'll only invite certain guests to their house because they don't want certain people. You know what I'm saying? There are people like that, right? So they'll make a good couple, you know? They'll have their own world. But to put one of those with the helper who wants to save the world, it's like going to be weird, I think. You know, does that make sense? So... You know, you're this very artistic, creative person married to this very left brain mathematician scientist. It may not be the best match. You know, you're creating art, you're creating music, you know, and he's like reading science magazines. I mean, he's doing crossword puzzles, you know, mathematical crossword puzzles, and you, you can't even add. You don't even know how much money you have in the bank. You know, you're just creating, artistic. That's all you care about, right? So, you know, or you're this like intellectual. You just like love to search for truth and meaning, right? And you marry a village girl who doesn't even know how to read. It's probably not going to work. Um, I'm sure there are some intellectuals that are so burned out and say, I just want to marry a village girl who's really simple. That may be there, but you have to understand that about yourself. You know, what's compatible for you. You have to understand your nature and what's compatible. <clears throat> I mean, I know some intellectual guys who have very simple wives. And they like that's what they want. They don't, that's, t that's companionship for them. But other guys may, you know, they may be. They may want a wife who's a professor of philosophy. It's just that's that's where they live in their head, and that's what's attractive to them. Though the world's not perfect, and matches like that aren't perfect, but the main thing that Shastra is saying: a Brahminical man should marry a woman who's Brahminical. 
a Kshatriya should marry a Kshatriya, you know, as far as possible, or, or at least um, their values should be similar, you know. Um, culturally, background-wise, the more similar it is, the better. It's just, you know, unless they're just by nature so compatible that these other things may not be as important, but um, I'd be careful about thinking about that because they are important. So, you have a spouse that likes Krishna consciousness, it's really into it, you're not really into it. For you, it's just a Sunday religion. For her, it's her life. Can that work? It can, if you respect one another. Um, can it be a little frustrating? Yeah. Um, it's not ideal. So these are things to consider. But the point, the other point I was making with understanding personality types, which is very, very important, not only in marriage, but for anything we're doing with other people, is when you, when you do any kind of study of personality types, whether, whether it's the Enneagram or whatever theories are out there, it's just basically what they're doing is they've studied human nature and they say people fall in these categories. It's just their DNA. It's the way they come in this world. The extrovert, the introvert, the party animal, the studious, the this and that. So, um, some of the personality types I've seen are like the um, detail-oriented person, you know, everything has to be perfect, the perfectionist type. And so, what we learn from that is there, there will be certain things about your spouse which are inherent within their personality type that it's just how they are. And you can never change that. It's just, you have to understand that's how they are and then accept it. And everything's fine once you accept it. That's just how she is, you know. Like, my spouse is always, it never, it doesn't pay attention to details. You ask, ask her, ask him, this or that. They're just totally not into de details. Just bother them. It just boggles their mind. They're, you know, they, you know, you give them a shopping list of eight things. They only get six. It's just, oh, I forgot the other two. You know, it's. Uh, Oh, you know, I'm not good at details, right? Don't you? You know, but I wrote it down for you. Yeah, but I didn't. I just didn't notice it. I mean, some people are like that. So you could get frustrated and scream at them and jump up and down and cry, but, but, um, or you could just accept that. Okay, this is what she's like. So, or he's like. And then everything's good. Once you accept everything, everything's good. When you don't accept it, it's a problem. So that's where the personality types help you. And in any of these personality type analyses, then you, you want to see if they have anything written about what kind of personality types get do better together and what don't. And, though, and therefore, when you're out there finding your Prince Charming or your Juliet, your Romeo or your Juliet, then you'll have an idea of the kinds of persons that would make better spouses. Now, there's another thing to watch out for, ladies and gentlemen, which this may be hard to watch out for. You may not always know it, but some people have very difficult childhoods. And because of the difficult childhoods they have, there's a lot of insecurities that surround them in their life. And if a person is it has some kind of emotional problem, then you could say one thing, which was just an innocent comment, and that could disrupt their whole life, and they could just run off, slam the door, and start crying or whatever. You, so you think I'm joking. No, I'm dead serious. Um, people, those, most of you have taken my forgiveness workshop, so you know in the forgiveness workshop how we talk about the personal sensitivities, core needs, core hurts. So some people have really big core hurts, and then you just press the button, the, you know, the wrong button, and they, they collapse. And so it, they, it's very difficult to be with these kinds of people because they're not emotionally healthy. And so if you're getting involved with a person, you might want to inquire a little bit about what was your childhood like? How, were your parents nice to you? 
Well, your sibling's nice to you, you know. You know, you might marry someone who's actually se sexually molested, and that person needs to get over that, or was abused by their parents physically or verbally. Or those kinds of people, they have difficult times in relationships. Otherwise, they can be, you know, fine in every other way. So it's something to be aware of. A perfectly normal, nice person who's been somewhat damaged growing up can have a really hard time in relationships. They may have a hard time getting close to people. They may be afraid of you, that you're going to do something to them, and you're, you're not doing anything wrong. So, if that doesn't scare you from getting married, I don't know what will. But it's a reality. And now, I'll scare you a little more, so put your seatbelts on. So, everybody is like this to some degree. Everybody is a little bit weird. It's just, you want to marry someone who's a little bit weird, not really weird. We're all a little weird. We do weird things. When you move in with someone and live with them, you start to see the weird things they do, right? It's just if you grow up with them, you don't really notice it anymore. But we're all a little weird. But the little weirdness we have, if it's just a little bit, it doesn't hurt anything or bother anything, and nobody even notices it. It's just when you have a lot of weirdness, then you bring it into a relationship, and then something your wife, your husband does something you don't like, and then you, you start sulking and complaining. You do all these little kid childish things because it's something that's going on in you. You haven't really, you know, from growing up, some something, whatever it is, you haven't fixed it. And so your lucky spouse is the recipient of your craziness. And I'm talking about good devotees, respected people behind the scenes in their homes can be like really childish and do crazy things. It's just the way it is. So, okay, right now we can end our classes on marriage because now nobody's going to want to get married after I had said that. So, look at yourself and ask yourself, would I like to be married to myself? I mean, if I had to marry someone like me, would that be good? Would I be happy? And you're going, oh, I don't know if I want to, you know, because I'm kind of weird sometimes. Right, Antonio? Would you want to be married to yourself? Antonio may have second thoughts about that. Yeah. Antonio, if you were married to yourself, sometimes we wouldn't, you wouldn't be able to find your spouse. They'd be in a cave somewhere, right? Going away for a few weeks. So you look at your own self, right? And you say, am I weird? Do I have some uh, uh, <laughs> things weird about me? And um, yeah, so, and weirdness makes it difficult for the people you work with and live with to work and live with you, right? Yes? So, as a spouse, even if you are weird, which means you just had a, you know, we're all weird in some way, but you realize your weirdness and you, and you try to heal it because you don't want to enter a relationship being this kind of person that just is like totally reactive about so many things. You make it hell for your partner. So as a service to your partner, you want to kind of work things out, whatever it takes to work it out. Read a book about your particular weirdness, go to a therapist, I don't know, chant 128 rounds, something. Face it, deal with it, improve it. And if you do that, basically what I'm saying is try to become normal. And the more normal you become, if you're around somebody who's not normal, you'll notice it. But if you're not normal, you won't. That's interesting, isn't it? So, you know, sometimes people get married and they say, God, I didn't realize my husband was so weird. But maybe if you were a little more normal, you would have realized he's not normal. I, I can't say for sure, always. But um, there are some pretty abnormal people out there. And it's probably a good idea you don't end up marrying one of them. And if you do, it's probably a good idea they get their act together because it's going to be a problematic. So, the moral, the moral of this story of what I'm saying is that as a spouse, you have an obligation to your spouse to be as normal as possible. Because people 
like living with people who are normal. They like living with people who are predictable. Any of you out there like living with a person who the first half of the day is really happy and easy to get along with, and the second half of the day is really angry and agitated, and the third half of the day you have no idea what they're going to be like? Of course not. Nobody wants to live with anybody like that. So if you're like that, you owe it to your spouse not to be like that. And whatever, you, know, you say, well, how do I not be like that? That's another talk. But the point is, if you become aware of what you're like, and in any way you would think, I wouldn't want to live with somebody like that, then correct it. And I just think is as, as you correct it, you will start to realize the idiosyncrasies and weirdness of another potential spouse. And so before it's too late and you're walking down the aisle and saying, I do, and you realize three months later, this person is weird. And had I known, I never would have married them. You figure that out before. And this does happen. Not only in Hollywood movies, it happens a lot. that People get married and a few months later, they realize they should have never gotten married. They're just so different. Or this one person has such deep emotional scars, they should have healed them way before even considering about getting married. So, now is everybody like completely frightened about getting married? Absolutely, 100%. Okay, then the class is over. We reached the goal of this class. No one's going to get married. Let's go on to something else. Hare Krishna. I go, Mahatma, how, how, how was it? You know, all your disciples, nobody gets married. I go, Just listen to my marriage classes. Scared them to death. They're all running away when they see the opposite sex. <laughs> I just did a workshop this weekend, so I'm kind of in a funny mood because I always have. Anyway, you understand. Um, there's another thing, another thing that's so interesting. I, I may have mentioned this, but I'll mention it again. It's so interesting. There's so many references to Grihastha life in the Bhagavatam. That in itself is interesting. But um, Ashalata, you're never too old. Ha <laughs> ha. I just have a godbrother who just got married at fifty nine. You're never too old. There's still there's life. You still have life ahead of you. So um so many, so many um, purports, you know, so many, not purports, so many stories about married couples and interaction with married couples in the Bhagavatam. But what's interesting, what's interesting is, I'm just sending a Skype to Anna, who's trying to escape me. I need to grab her into class. So, but what one what's interesting? You might say, okay, well, that's interesting that Bhagavatam is describing all these situations of marriage and how couples were dealing with one another. Because you would think it's not really it's not really what you would find in the Bhagavatam. But what's more interesting is that Prabhupada's writes purports about it, you know, because you could he could look at it and say, well, this is the Bhagavatam, and this is not really the purpose of the Bhagavatam. And he gives these elaborate purports, just showing how important it is to understand Grihastha life. Otherwise, why would he write all these purports? So there are a lot of purports in Prabhupada's books about how to live as a Grihastha. Why would he write them? because they're important. Prabhupada, in his purports, talks about male and female psychology so men and women can know how to relate together and live peacefully in household life. He talks a lot about it. The man likes to be pleased. This is how the woman controls him. He always wants to be in a superior position. He wants the woman to be in an inferior position. She takes that because she knows that pleases him. 
she adapts to his mentality in that way. He becomes putty in her hands and do anything she wants. So Prabhupada, that's what he's saying there. That sounds like right out of a some, you know, 2014 marriage book, marriage workshop. So it, it, it's it's all Prabhupada lays it all out. Here are the rules, this is how it works, this is how a man this is a man, this is a woman, how they think. And interesting, isn't it? That he would put so much time and attention into it. So what what do we take from that? We take that he wanted us to make this work. It's very important to make it work. Hina, no children, marriage is okay. Hina, anything goes these days. I mean, you know, um, Hina, she's making a comment about the 59-year-old. Well, you know, ultimately, you do what will help you be, make, you do what helps you become Krishna conscious. So, maybe that, maybe that man would be worse off if he didn't get married. Maybe it's the best thing. And you might say, well, how could that be the best thing? Ask him, he'll tell you. Um, it just happens, right? It's just, you're never too old. Don't ever think you're too old. You might think, no, nah, I'm old, I'm not attractive. Someone will be attracted to you, don't worry. And I wouldn't be attracted to any old guys my age. Don't say that. Somebody, there's always somebody. Now, doesn't mean you will be, but at least we can consider anything's possible. So, um, anyway, back to the point that Prabhupada is, is giving us a lot of instruction about Grihastra life, which means it's important. Otherwise, he wouldn't waste his time with it. It's important to learn. Now, the problem is, what I find, uh, Ashalat is picky. Yeah, it's good to be picky. Good to be picky. Not too picky after you're married, but before. If you're picky after you're married, then you drive the guy nuts. See, that's the... The guys like to control and the women like to nag. Bad combo. So, anyway. So, so Prabhupada is helping us be good grihastas. And so the problem, at least one of the problems I see, and I think it's a big problem, you might look at Grihastha life and think it's like peripheral to Krishna consciousness. And the real thing is, you know, chant, hear Bhagavatam, do service like that. You know, Grihastha life is like, why, why give energy to it? You know, that's the, um, that's the mentality. So, um, we shouldn't think that way. We should think, this is important. We should think, this is important. I have to master this. As much as I have to master japa, and as much as I have to master um, anything in Krishna consciousness that's important, I shouldn't relegate this to a lesser um, um, I shouldn't relegate this to a lesser position. If we think that way, if we think that way, that's going to make a huge difference in the quality of our Grihastha ashram because we won't give up on it. We say, no, my wife, my husband's too difficult. We won't give up on it. We won't give up on ourselves becoming better spouses. We won't give up on them. But we'll realize that, no, this is an important ashram and we have to make it work. So, even if you're 59, Hina, make it work. I mean, if you're going to do it, make it work. I, I wouldn't recommend it, but if you're going to do it, do it right. So, in other words, you, ha you if you see, well, it's all about chanting Hare Krishna. That's what it's all about. You know, chant good rounds. Okay, that's true. But it doesn't mean it's not because it's all about chanting Hare Krishna, it's not all about being a good grihasta or a good brahmachari or vanaprastha sannyas. That doesn't follow. 
See, but so that's, we tend to like relegate things. Say, well, if I do this well, that means I don't have, it's okay if I don't do that well. Because the doing the japa well will balance out the fact that my grihastha life is a total mess. No. A devotee thinks, whatever I do, I should do it successfully. And it doesn't mean to do something successfully, I have to fail at doing something else. But a lot of times we think, well, it doesn't matter if I fail as a grihastha as long as I'm chanting good rounds every day, so everything's fine. It's not fine. It's not why the whole point is why is Prabhupada in his purports, why is he spending so much time talking about Grihastha life if it doesn't really matter whether it's good or not? Because it does matter, because it affects our Krishna consciousness. Um, and if you have a good stable Grihastha life, your Krishna consciousness will tend to be stable. He is not fifty nine yet, but you will be someday. Don't worry, I guarantee it. Just get married before you're 59. You know, Prabhupada said marriage after 30 is not very nice, not very happy. I'm not sure what he meant. I think he meant materially it's not enjoyable after 30. So, um, anyway, why don't you ask some questions? Because I think, uh, I think I've said everything I needed to say today. But this point, is, this point is very important. This point I'm making is very important. That you should never think that being a good brahmacharya or grihastha vanaprastha sannyas is not important. And you would think, yeah, of course, being a, you'd say, of course, well, you know, if you're sannyasi, being a good sannyasi is really important. But it's not any more important than being a good grihastha. So, you know, don't relegate it to a. Don't relegate it to a position of non-importance. You know how I say, we succeed by failing. I have a lecture, succeeding by failing. What does that mean? It doesn't mean try, try, try again. Failure is the pillar of success. What it means is, you fail in one area of your life so you can succeed in another. So we don't want to do that, you know. Well, I'm a good devotee, just I, had, I did it at the cost of destroying my family. So that's, you know, I, I get up every morning, but my family is, you know, they've left me and this and that, but I'm a good devotee. So you've, you've failed. Your failure becomes the so-called cause of your success. You see what I'm saying? So... Yeah, once so Anna is saying, once Prabhupada said all the men should be married, and all, um, all the men should be brahmacharya and all the women should be married, but how is that possible? Very good question. They asked Prabhupada the same question. And he said, that requires intelligence. In other words, if you're a good manager, you're given an impossible task. And you figure it out. Now, let's understand what Prabhupada said. I mean, what's, what's the meaning? Ideal situation for every man in the ideal perfect universe, don't get married. If you don't get, don't get married, live in an ashram and be a monk. If you're a monk, you don't have to work. You don't have to get a job. You'll have other monks wash your clothes. You'll have other monks cooking for you. It's the life. It's the life. And all you have to do is preach. And you can serve your guru 24 hours a day, seven days a week. No worries. Don't get married. It's the ideal situation. And we'll have a whole army of single men, hundreds of men up every morning, Mongol Artik, fired up, Prabhu. Ideal situation. Now, from the women's side, the ideal situation for the woman is to have a good husband who can help her, guide her, and be her companion, give her children. And Prabhupada says that generally women are not as spiritually as strong as men, and therefore they do better as married in a married, they do better married, and that 
it would be good if some of our men marry the women because they need it. So that's the other side. So that's that's why Prabhupada, he was saying, all the women should be married and all the men shouldn't be. But of course, if all the women should be married, they have to marry some man who's a devotee. And so therefore, in a, in a letter, Prabhupada said, some of the men should marry the women because they're coming. And we need to protect them and we need to help them and they do better as married. So the simple way to resolve this whole dilemma is just wait because most of the brahmacharis will get married anyway, no matter how many times you tell them not to, and it's maya, it's a deep well, women are maya, just miserable, you're going to work like an ass, blah, blah, blah. 365 days a year you could tell them that, and it doesn't mean they're all not going to get married. So the managerial solution to this dilemma is just wait, then they'll all get married, most of them. So don't worry. It's just, and then they'll get married, and they'll realize I waited five years too long. I was in total denial and repression for the last five years of my brahmacharya life, but better late than never. So that's how it goes. Now, if a man can remain single, it actually is better because he can dedicate his whole life to Krishna. But not every man can do that. And to remain single is not to be artificially repressed. And then you remain single when you're 55, you're 59, you decide, I need to get married. So, you don't want to do that. Right? Do you? I hope not. So, if a woman wants to get married, she should not feel there's anything wrong with her. She should feel she's perfectly normal in having those desires. If a man wants to get married, he should not think there's something wrong with me. Somewhere all down the road, I made a mistake. No, he should think it's totally normal for a man, a conditioned soul, to to get married. It's nothing wrong. It's actually, I think I was saying before, what you should think is if you remain brahmachari, you should think I'm weird. Something's wrong with me. I don't want to get married because all men want to get married. So that's actually what's weird. It's, of course, is weird in a good way because it helps you in Krishna consciousness, but. Statistically speaking, remaining a brahmachari is not normal. So no man who wants to get married should think there's something wrong with him. He should just think, I'm just being normal. See, these other brahmacharis, they're the weird ones. I'm just being normal. Of course, the other brahmacharis think you're weird, but statistically speaking, they're the weird ones. But if you can be a weird brahmachari, more power to you because you'll have a great life and you'll do a lot of service for Prabhupada and you can actually do it. So, Anna, did that answer your question or was that like totally unexpected and out to le out in left field? But anyway, that's what Prabhupada meant. And and in some cases Prabhupada um, in some cases Prabhupada would encourage men to get married because there were so many women coming and he'd say, you know, they they should be married. So, um, I, think, I don't know if I told you that story that um, Radha Swami has some disciples who are doing, doing some preaching work where they're dealing with women more than brahmacharis should uh, to keep a healthy life. And then they weren't having any problem. It's just that the nature of their preaching, there was a lot of preaching to women and a lot of counseling to women. So then he said, well, if you want to continue with this preaching, then you should get married. And none of these men wanted to get married, or I don't think they need to get married. But he said, well, rather than, you know, chance and accident of falling down, better you be married, because you're dealing very closely with women. So there are cases when the spiritual master will ask his disciples to marry. There are a couple of doctors who wanted to become brahmacharis after medical school, and Maharaj said, no, just do your internship, and then we'll talk about it later. And they kept going on, you know, now we're ready to be devotees. No, just practice medicine for a while. Now we're ready to be devotees a year later. Year. So eventually he said, I want to start a hospital and I want you to help. And those were the first doctors of Bhaktivedanta Hospital. Many of them were men who wanted to be brahmacharis. And he said, no, get married. Because to do that, that kind of work, it's better you're married. So sometimes the spiritual master will actually tell you. So, I think I think what's really important for us, 
Yeah. They have a, it's on, I think it's on Iskand Desire Tree, Grihasta Manual, right, Ashley? Interesting book you can read. So, I think it's, I think it's, like I was telling Antonio, it's, it's, or I don't know if I was telling Antonio, no, maybe I was, I was telling another person today, yesterday, who was asking me. I think it's better to, to think, it's not, it's not about, Brahmacharya Grihasta, if I, if, I'm, if I remain Brahmacharya, I'm successful. If I get Grihasta, I'm a failure. It's not about that. It's about what is best for your Krishna consciousness. So it's not like, I got married, I'm a failure. It's like, was that what you need? Is that your nature? What's your nature? It's not, don't be a Brahmacharya if your nature is not a Brahmacharya. It doesn't work. And don't get married if your nature is a Brahmacharya. You'll drive your wife crazy and she'll keep asking you, Questions like, why did you marry me? Why did you get married? You want to be a brahmacharya. You see what I mean? Because some men do get married and they shouldn't. Okay, so Hina has a question. Question from my side. I have this mental block about children. Is it necessary to have children if you're married? That's the main thing I have a phobia about. Um... Uh, Okay, interesting question. The answer is yes, but the answer is not absolutely yes. Because if we work on the principle, do what's favorable for Krishna consciousness, then if it ends up being more favorable for you to be married but not have kids, then it's okay. Although the general answer, the textbook answer, is marriage is for having children. So the point is, you have to marry a man who doesn't want children, and who's not going to change his mind five or ten years from now, which you can never know. And you don't know five or ten years from now if you won't change your mind either. But as far as possible, you want to marry someone the ideal person for you to marry, Hina, if you're not married, is someone who's okay either way. He says, I can have children, I cannot have children. And then, if for some reason you change your mind, he's fine. Now, the other half of your question is, why do you have a phobia? Because maybe you actually do deep down want kids, but you have some fear about it or something that could be resolved, and then your motherly nature to want to have children might come out. So that's another issue. As you say, you have a phobia, so it could be something there that just has to be cleared up. If you marry a brahmacharya, okay, what does it say? Rasha. Okay, Rana Swami did a good book on Grihasa life. He will ask us to wake up and force for Mangalarti. If you marry a brahmacharya, <laughs> Ashley doesn't want to go to Mangalarti. Don't marry a brahmacharya, Ashley. Ashley should marry a nice devotee who likes, who likes to live nice and mellow, no pressure. But there's actually there's some women that like to wake up and go to Mangalarti, so they should marry the brahmacharya. Actually, there's some women who are like brahmacharyas, so they should marry the brahmacharya. But just to set the record straight, ladies and gentlemen, there are men who get married, but they maintain the bhava or nature. Um, well, Ashley knows. They get married, but they live like brahmacharis. And they expect their wives, Ashley, correct me if I'm wrong, to be like men. They expect their wives to be like brahmacharis, and they treat them like brahmacharis. And they want them to do all kinds of austerities and penances, like rising early, taking cold showers, going on sankirtan for days on end, right? Eating very little, learning shlokas. They want you to do things like that. Don't spend money on jewelry and saris. That's the brahmacharya husband. So if you're in that mood, hey, yeah. Um, if you're if you're if you're also in that mode, then marry the brahmachari husband. Yeah. So um, anyway, 
I bet your husband was like that. So, but it's a good point. And the point is, you should know that before you get married by asking questions. Are you a brahmachari in a grihasta dress? Will you ever be a grihasta? Trying to be a gentleman, I don't know. It's hard to be a gentleman in Kali Yuga. But I do understand these things, so I can, I can show you what to watch out for. But gentlemen out there, um, sometimes you get married and you don't actually get married. You remain brahmachari. And if that's, you have to change your mind. You have to realize the mentality of, of Grihastha is different than the mentality of a Brahmacharya. Now, what Bhaktivedya Purnaswami says about women, and it's not, he's not saying this as a criticism, he's just saying it as, as something which is their nature and true, which husbands should understand, which is women cannot or do not like the levels of austerity of men. Men can do more austerity. It's their nature. Right? So, okay, we're going out on the road. Bring your wife. You know, we're going to sleep in the van. You know, all right. You know, when they're 22, sure. When they're 52, don't try it. It's not going to work. Women, they need soft things and things which are comfortable in, in ways that men don't always need. Not that men don't need it, but generally, men can do more austerity than women. So, when you marry the when you marry the brahmachari husband, he's going to want you to live like a brahmachari and do all the austerities of a brahmachari. And you're going to be not too happy. Unless in your last life you were a brahmachari and in this life you really wished you were a brahmachari, then you can marry the brahmachari husband. You'll be, live happily ever after. Um, okay. Yeah. So, anything else? I figured Ashley's ex-husband out perfectly, right? How did I know? I'm so smart. I must have mystic power. I must know everything, right? So, Pollock. We're going to talk to Pollock right now. Pollock is a credible songwriter and writer. I bet Pollock someday will be famous as a writer. Um, from From... Pollock, from your experience, I think one of the most powerful things you have learned or will learn or are learning is that by your nature, you actually mold the nature of your partner. So you can make your partner very compatible or very incompatible. Even if you're compatible, you can make your partner incompatible if you don't or don't live in a way which is pleasing to them or responsive to them. So, realizing that, it's, it's very valuable because then now you can work on all the areas of your life where you're lacking in understanding that to have any kind of good relationship, I need to be full and complete in myself. And that will make it easier on the other person. So, that that's one of the things that sometimes happens in relationships. When they don't go well, you look and you say, well, did I, did I contribute in any way to this? And how can I improve myself so in the future when I have a relationship, I don't make it, I make it so there's, you know, like sometimes you want someone to like you. Why don't you like me? What's wrong with you? Everyone else likes me. So you have to be like, you know, say, why doesn't, why doesn't my wife like me or my girlfriend like me or this? And you say, well, maybe you're not likable. You know, did you ever think of that? No, I never thought of that. Something wrong with her. Right? Isn't that how we think? So, how about becoming likable? You want people to like you. That's common sense. Be likable. Don't make it, diff don't make it hard on your, your boyfriend or girlfriend to love you. It's, it's, um, one time I was, I was having a, I'm a songwriter like Pollock, Peleg actually, and I was having, there's some problem I was having with my wife, or, you know, I did something that she didn't appreciate, and then I was thinking, yeah, the hit song is, you make it so, uh, maybe someone already wrote a song, but you make it so hard to love you. 
you know, sometimes people, you, you want to show affection to them, right? But the way they treat you is so bad, you can't. So you make it so hard to love you. Pollock, you could write the song. You'll make millions with this song, but you have to give me 50% for the idea. Um, yeah. So, but now, if we take this song, Pollock, you make it so hard to love you and then put yourself in that position. Do I make it hard for people to love me by my behavior, by my attitudes and so forth? And then if you, if you say, I do, then you work on it and you come to the point where you say, no, now I don't make it hard for people to love me. Then when we ask you that question, would you, would you have a problem being married to yourself? You'd say, no, I'd like to be because I'm, I act in a way that I'm lovable. And if you act in a way that you're lovable, you'll be loved. And if you act in a way that is, um, that makes it difficult for your spouse, then, then it's just really hard. You make it hard for them to be a good husband or wife, even if they want to be, right? Does that make sense?